Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Student Steel Bridge Competition webinar, Bridging the Gap and Getting Started. Today is September 28th, 2021. My name is Christy Sattler, and I am the Senior Engineer for University Relations at AISC, and I will be moderating today's webinar. After a couple of unusual years due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are excited to be kicking off the 2022 competition season. Some of you on the call may be brand new to the competition, or perhaps you are trying to reboot your team after a couple of years with limited participation, or maybe you are a seasoned participant simply looking for new ways to recruit new team members. Whatever bring you, brings you here today, I am very glad that you joined us. Also on the line today are three experienced SFBC alumni who are looking forward to sharing their experiences and advice with you. A majority of our time today will be dedicated to hearing from them. Here's what we'll cover today. I'll give you a brief overview of the Student Steel Bridge competition and the various elements of the competition. Next, we'll talk about the support and resources that AISD provides to help support you and your team. Then we'll spend the bulk of our time hearing from our SFBC alumni I have several questions that were prepared ahead of time to start the discussion, and then we will also leave some time at the end for live questions. Just a few announcements before we get started. First, if you have any questions for our speakers, you can ask those in the chat feature. You may submit your question at any point during the presentation, and we'll do our best to answer those as time allows. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, or if you want to ask an anonymous question, please send a direct chat to Maria Manukin. You will see her name in the drop down. I also want to note that we will not be answering any questions that are specific to the rules. So if you have questions about the rules, you can ask them on our rules and clarifications page at AISD.org slash SFCC. And finally, I do need to mention that this webinar is being recorded. We will post it on our website for anyone who may have missed it and for you to refer back to later. Okay, so what is the SFCC? So the Student Steel Bridge Competition, or the SSBC for short, started back in 1987. It is a collegiate competition that challenges student teams to design, fabricate, and construct a scaled steel bridge. That first competition included three schools and took place in Michigan. And as you can tell from the photos, in addition to the hairstyles and fashion choices, things were a bit different back then, especially in regards to what is considered a safety violation. And then after more than 30 years, the program has grown to include around 200 schools. There are now 20 regional competitions all across the country, and the top finishers at those regional competitions qualify to participate in the national final. So this is a photo of the team uh, at the University of Florida, who was the champion of the 2021 national finals. Their bridge weighed only 171 pounds, and their construction time was only 1 minute and 49 seconds. The SSBC is a fantastic opportunity to take what you are learning in the classroom and apply it to real life. As an engineer myself, there is something really special about taking something from two dimensions on paper and turning it into something tangible. It's a great chance to learn how things fit or maybe don't fit together. And we've heard from many SSBC alumni that it was a highlight of their academic careers. It's also a great opportunity to develop your project management skills and to connect with people in the steel design and fabrication industry. So what do you need? Well, you need a team of students as well as a faculty advisor. You'll need some raw materials and tools for putting your bridge together, and we'll talk about um, ways we can support you and help you source those materials. Uh, there's, you also need some space to fabricate your bridge and also practice construction. Uh, depending on where your regional competition is, you'll need some funds to travel to that event. And then, of course, you'll need a competitive spirit. There is an official set of rules for the competition and these change every year. The 2022 rules are available on our website at AISC.org slash SSBC. If you have any specific questions about the rules, you may submit those using the official forms on our website. Those questions are reviewed and answered by the rules committee and they post the responses on the clarification page so that everyone can see them. Again, there are 20 regional competitions this year, and these will typically be held as part of the ASCE Student Symposia events. This map shows the approximate locations of those 20 symposia. And this year's national finals will be held at Virginia Tech over Memorial Day weekend. There are several elements of the competition, including timed construction, lateral and vertical load testing, and weighing. 
and bridges are also judged on aesthetics. Uh, we'll only briefly go over these today, so I do encourage you to review the rules in close detail to understand the requirements. We also have a competitor's guide on our website where you can read more about these different elements and learn what to expect during each component of a competition. All right, so the main competition kicks off with the time construction event. Teams will organize the pieces of their bridge and their tools in the staging yard. And then once the judge says go, the timer starts and the construction team will race to assemble the bridge as quickly as possible while avoiding any rules violations, such as dropping something in the river, or in the case of this year, it's actually a highway. And then once complete, the constructed bridge is inspected by the judges for conformance with the rules. They'll take a look at the overall dimensions, check the clearances, and look at the connections. After construction, the bridge moves on to lateral and vertical load testing. The lateral load test is conducted first, where a weighted pulley system is used to pull on the bridge in the lateral direction, and the bridge cannot sway more than a specified amount. Then the bridge goes on to the vertical loading station, where the team will load the bridge with 2,500 pounds using steel angles. The location for the vertical loading is determined randomly at the beginning of the competition with a die roll. So all teams participating at that competition will load their bridge in the same location along the span. The bridge is also weighed. And then the bridge is judged on aesthetics. Uh, the bridges will all typically be put on display at the same time, usually prior to the start of the main competition, so that the panel of judges can rank them in reference to one another. And then all of those elements of the competition then factor into the awards. So there are several award categories listed here, and you'll see that the first few, aesthetics, construction speed, lightness, and stiffness, are based mostly on the raw scores at respective stations in the competition. But then once you get to the construction economy and structural efficiency categories, those combine multiple elements into the score, and you'll have to consider different trade-offs. So for instance, construction economy considers not only the amount of time that it took to build the bridge, but also the number of builders. So it's up to you to determine if it makes sense to use more builders and construct the bridge faster, or does it make sense to take a little more time and use fewer builders? Similarly, structural efficiency considers both the weight and measured deflection. So similar to a real world engineering problem, it's up to you to think about the trade-offs between using more or less material and the effects that has on the overall deflection. And the equations for these are outlined in the rules. The cost estimation is a relatively new category, and it's an award given to the team that has the best estimate of their team's overall performance rating in the competition. And then that overall performance rating is the sum of the construction cost and the structural cost, and that's what's used to determine the overall winner. There are also a few special awards. The SSBC Team Engagement Award recognizes a team that demonstrates a commitment to fostering equity, diversity, and inclusion. All teams that compete at a regional competition are eligible for this award, but participation is not mandatory and it has no effect on your overall score. Teams may apply for this award using a submission form on the SSBC website. There are also two other awards that are given at the national finals. There's the Robert E. Schaaf Junior Spirit of the Competition Award, and the Frank J. Hatfield Ingenuity Award. And I wanted to point out here that Aaron Murph here on the right was the team captain for the University of Alaska Anchorage team that received the Ingenuity Award in 2019, and he's one of our panelists today. Okay, so let's talk about some of the support that you'll receive from us at AISB. There are several resources and guides on our website, and I encourage you to check out the team resources page. So in addition to the competitor's guide that I mentioned earlier, you'll also find a safety awareness guide and a guide with strategies for working remotely, which may be particularly helpful for some of you this fall, depending on the conditions at your campus. Um, and there's also a guide for your faculty advisors. Eligible teams will receive a $500 stipend for participating in a regional competition. You'll need to complete ASCE's student chapter SSBC participation form by October 30th to receive this benefit, as well as any other benefits from other sponsors. The link for that form will be provided in the host mailer number one, which you should be receiving in mid-October from your host. And note that there may be other benefits from other sponsors. So we already know of at least one fabricators association 
that wants to give an additional stipend to teens in their local area. And so we'll use the information you submit in that form to help them get in contact with you so that you can get that stipend. If you haven't already, I encourage you to sign up to receive SSBC email updates. There is a link on the right-hand side of the team resources page at AISC.org slash SSBC. We frequently send emails with updates about the program, upcoming webinars, and general announcements, as well as notifications when a new rules clarification is posted. AISC has an extensive member network, and we can help you get in contact with local fabricators in your area. Many fabricators are loyal supporters of the SSBC and have helped teams in a variety of ways over the years including donating materials, making monetary contributions, and mentoring teams. A local fabricator may also be able to assist with some of the fabrication, but please note that we highly encourage teams to be as involved in the fabrication process as they can. And there's a form on the team resources page where you can request our assistance with developing a partnership. And lastly, you can follow us on social media for the latest SSBC news, as well as general AISD updates, and you can find us on any of these channels. All right, so now to the exciting part. Um, we'll have a chat with our SSBC alumni, and I am uh, very excited to be joined today by three recent, seasoned, and very passionate SSBC alumni. Uh, we have Kate Arnson from HGA Architects. Michael DiPiero from Simpson, Gumperts and Hager, and Aaron Murph from Turnigan Marine Construction. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen here. And our panelists will join us. So I think before we get started, I'd like just for each of them to uh, introduce themselves and kind of tell us a little bit about their involvement and in, in over the years with SSBC and uh, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and start with you, Kate. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kate, and right now I work in Milwaukee at HGA, um, like Christy mentioned. And uh, for school, I went to University of Michigan. I was involved on the Steel Bridge team for four and a half years. Um, I graduated in 2018 with my graduate degree, so I didn't have any experience with uh, any of the virtual or um, COVID impacted competitions, but I did attend the last in-person competition in 2019. Okay, fantastic. All right, how about you, Michael? Yeah, of course. Um, so I currently work for Simpson, Gumpert, and Hager, as we mentioned, in the Chicago office. I went to Ohio State, got my bachelor's, bachelor's degree there, and then I got my master's from uh, UC Berkeley right after. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's in 2020, which was when the pandemic uh, came, I see a Go Bucks, Go Bucks Camden. Um, so I started as a sophomore at the Steel Bridge team, and I'm just, we were a totally new team, we just kind of were getting things all set up. And then my involvement grew um, my junior year as we had more experience, and then I would be team captain the senior year. So I knew we didn't get to compete, but it was a really awesome time while I could do it, while I could uh, be on the team, so. Thanks, Michael. And last but not least, Aaron. Yeah, my name is Aaron Wirth. Um, I went to the University of Alaska Anchorage. I graduated in 2019 uh, with my bachelor's, and that was the last year I participated. Um, I, I did it for four years. The first year when I was a freshman, um, I wasn't really that involved. I was kind of just learning how it went and how, you know, how the competition was supposed to go and the design and fabrication and then gradually got more and more involved in the last year my senior year um, I was a team captain and, and uh, yeah that was a really neat experience so 2019 was last year that I was heavily involved with it. All right well great so you know as I mentioned before we probably have a wide variety of people on the line depending on their their different involvement but I think one of the first questions that kind of comes up is the rules just got released where in the world do you start? Um, I don't know, Aaron, you want to walk us through how did your team kind of get things get things started once you knew the rules were active on the website? Sure, yeah. Um, so one of the first things that we would do is, I mean, obviously we open up the rules and I like to go straight to the benchmen section just to see what the major changes are there. You know, if the footings have changed, um, the spacing, the river, things like that. But I think the most important thing with the rules and 
I guess it differs. If, if you're a brand new team, you should really just read through all the rules and like really try and understand what each rule does, um, what it means for your bridge. And it's really nice if you can bring in somebody that's competed before to try and like interpret these because sometimes they don't make a lot of sense if you've never competed before. If you're a team that's competed in the past, uh, doing a PDF compare between the current rules and the previous year's rules can be really helpful because sometimes there's subtle changes that, or I would consider them subtle, but changes that you might not notice. Um, you'll just gloss over them and all of a sudden it gets to the competition time and you're like, shoot, that, uh, that rule actually can, uh, can impede how we, how, we, uh, how we do in this competition. Yeah, I would say the same thing about just starting off reading the rules. It's pretty shocking how many members of a team haven't read the rules once you get a couple months into it. And I think it's really important for every member on the team and not just the captains or the design leads um, to read the rules because it's to win the competition, you have to follow them. That's really the key. I think that's something that gets overlooked a lot, but I know in my regional competition, usually the teams that limited penalties and followed all the rules um, and really tried to optimize the, you know, their construction economy scores of looking at the, you know, updated formulas for how much weight counts and how much deflection counts, things like that. Um, the more you pay attention to those, the better you do, which seems obvious, but I think that people get caught up in making a bridge and don't stop to think and take a week and just understand what they're doing and know what you're aiming for before you start getting into design. Yeah, I'll uh, fully agree with all that. And the last thing you want to do, which I had to do one year, is have to change something on your grade or be before competition where you found something in your rules. So read the rule book, make sure everyone on the team does it, and you know every letter like the back of your hand. And like you all said, it seems like a pretty straightforward no-brainer, but it, it's very, very important uh, to being successful. So, um, you know, I think you know, fabricating the bridge is probably a, a big component of what of what you do um, and like a lot of your efforts. So, um, Kate, kind of walk me through, you know, what, how did your team approach the fabrication? What kind of spaces you have on campus? Yeah, um, at University of Michigan, we were really lucky to have a machine shop for student project teams. So that was something where we um, had the space and we had a few mills and a lathe um, and also, um, you know, the capacity to weld, which, you know, a lot of schools might not have. Um, so we were kind of lucky from that aspect. And because of that, we end up doing a majority of the fabrication ourselves in the shop. Um, some years we've had a fabricator partner who's laser cut some of our longer tubes for us that they don't quite fit on the mills. Um, but we do the rest of it ourselves. And I think the more that you, the more established your team is, the more you can pass down and train people in fabrication and really start to dial in on your tolerances and improve the quality of your construction. Um, but I think starting off, it's just, it's important to be realistic about what you can complete and how long it will take and how many people you need and what skills you need. Um, Cause you do have to start planning the training and what learning how to use everything and ordering your steel way earlier um, in the year than you actually will be fabricating. Yeah, for like the fabrication area on campus, we would have, it was called the high bay. Um, and it was pretty much just an open concrete floor that had a high roof. And we were allowed to use that for a couple of months throughout the year for like finishing up the uh, fabrication part of our bridge. Usually we would try to fabricate off campus somewhere um, just cause like, tools would be a little bit more readily available. Um, and the time frame we were allowed to work in there was a little more, a little easier to work with. Um, but I guess one thing, if you're a new school that's starting and you're having a hard time sourcing like your tools and stuff, what we would do, and there was a group of maybe like five of us that were pretty um, fabrication savvy, we could actually pool most of our like personal tools together. Like I had a welder, a buddy of mine had a couple of grinders. Like we kind of pieced enough tools together to be able to fabricate this bridge and not necessarily the machining aspect. The first year we didn't have anything that was machined. It was very like, very basic. It didn't turn out that great, but it, I, mean, I guess it turned out okay. We competed, we made it to the regional competition. We were happy with it. Um, but in short, uh, our fabrication area was just an area of the school, a concrete floor that was maybe, you know, 80 feet by 30 feet or so big enough that we could practice um, competing there. And then also whenever we had to just similar bridge, we'd have something broken, we could fix it.
And then how about once you kind of get everything fabricated, obviously you're gonna practice construction. Um, you know, so how much how much time did you typically leave for for practicing construction? And I'll uh, start with sort of Michael. You know, what how much how much of a buffer did you have between finishing your bridge and making it to the regional competition? Well, I think of the three of us, oh, I had the least buffer usually from what I remember. Um, we would usually get it done maybe two weeks before competition is when we'd have or maybe even one week sometimes. But it was usually pretty close to the competition. And then we would spend like a few days, um, maybe grinding a few things down, filing just to make sure everything fit together, um, see what ways we can optimize construction. And then the rest of the time, we just rebuilt the bridge over and over again. So um, if, you, if you can do it in longer than one or two weeks, I highly, highly recommend it but you can do it with one or two weeks before competition. So. Kate and Aaron, are you about the same longer? Yeah, you know, we shot for two weeks before. Um, and something to that too is you don't have to have your bridge completely finished when you start um, construction practice. Like oftentimes our bridge would still need pieces that would have to be welded out or sometimes we'd actually be missing a piece or two. They wouldn't be like critical ones. But I think getting like that first couple of builds in is really important because it gets you thinking about like your build sequence, um, how large of a construction crew you want, um, what pieces are going to go on which side of the river or whatever the obstacle is that you're um, just getting that first build or two really helps the whole team start thinking. And I think it actually helps the whole team start to realize, especially the new members, how the rules actually work, like how it drops affect um, measuring all your members, we fit them all in a box uh, before I usually the first build, things like that. It just kicks off, I feel like, the actual competition part where you're like, okay, this is our goal. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to build this thing in the fastest or the shortest amount of time we possibly can. So, yeah, two weeks was our minimum. And usually the first build would take like an hour or an hour and a half. It took really long and everybody would be like super disappointed because they're like, there's no way we're ever gonna win with an hour and a half build. But then you really see it start come down. You know, you, you go from an hour and a half build, to like a 45 minute build, to like half an hour build and so on and so forth. And I think another thing to note there is we would set uh, a goal number of builds before like the regional competition. And I can't remember if that was like 20 or 30 builds, but we would try and keep track of that. Um, previous years and see you kind of tell where you like start to uh start to stop losing time so that we, we'd have a goal of maybe 20 or 30 builds and, and start two weeks from the competition yeah i'd say for our team we really love the uh construction aspect of it so that was one of the ways that we got newer people involved or people who didn't have um training the machine shop yet so often we would use a previous year's bridge and start practicing in like February and just getting, you know, a freshman um, a feeling for how the competition works and, you know, learn how to use a ratchet and just have everything set out and understand the rules before we were even finished with the bridge. If your team is big enough, um, that was a good way to kind of intro people into what it would look like um, and build some excitement for when you got to the, uh, you know, the real bridge for the year. Um, and usually that would be like, ideally a month before a competition, um, but kind of like Aaron said, you can still be working on things and adding smaller pieces while you're practicing. Yeah, so kind of as all three of you alluded to, sometimes time can get pretty tight towards the end once you're up against that regional competition date. Um, but uh, did you have time to load test your bridge? I think Aaron, you've shared a couple stories with me about um, actually being able to not only practice constructing the bridge, but also load testing it. So, so tell me about that. Yeah, I think load testing is kind of critical in my mind. You, you don't really want to show up to the competition and load your bridge and have it fail. I think, you know, if the critical things to do, load testing, in my eyes, is one of the, one of the most important things. Um, we would usually, uh, I guess it wouldn't, we would usually have a few builds in before we load test just because the bridge wasn't like finished structurally or finished actual fabrication generally. But um, we would always find something out with load test. There's always some surprise, something you forgot about. Um, one time we popped a weld, um, just all sorts of details are exposed when you load the bridge. And usually we try to load it like 100 or 200 pounds over, um, which is always really sketchy because I feel like our bridges were always like right there or like this thing could fail. Um, but I felt like that was a good thing to do, and especially with the um, how we travel with our bridge too. It's 
like we have to fly on a plane with it um and it's kind of subject to a lot of abuse and so we wanted to know that it was tough enough to handle a little bit extra a little bit extra load a little bit of tweaking here and there sort of thing so if you can load test i really think you should um and it doesn't have to be anything fancy one year we just got a bunch of steel plate and started hanging it from the bridge like underneath it um and we kind of I don't know if we're exactly on the weight, like we're probably within 100 pounds or so, but it's nice to load it up and it builds a lot of confidence in, in your team. Yeah, and I'll mention to our audience too, you know, at the regional competitions, we AISC provides all the loading angles. I mean, 2,500 pounds is a lot, is a lot of load. Um, and so don't, don't shy away from load testing because you don't have those specific angles. There's a lot of different options for applying the load. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll post something on our team resources page that um, last year with the Compete from Campus teams had to find different ways to load their bridge on their campus with the resources they had. So we have some suggestions and ideas for you so you can kind of tap into those if you're, if you're able to load test. Um, and then Aaron, you, you also alluded to, to traveling with your bridge. You're probably a slightly unique situation with having to fly with the bridge. Um, so let's hear about that and then maybe Kate or Michael can kind of chime in about maybe driving with the bridge is two different different scenarios. Yeah, so since we're like based in Anchorage, Alaska, I don't think, sometimes there's a regional competition in Alaska, but most of the time it's in the lower 48, and so I'll have to fly down. And that's kind of tricky. We'll usually build um, these plywood boxes, and I think we've used the same ones for the last couple of years, but the goal with plywood boxes, they've gotta be light enough where you can stuff a certain number of bridge pieces in there with like foam and things like that so they don't get damaged during shipping and also so they're we would shoot have them under 50 pounds so that way like um each person was allowed like two free check bags on alaska airlines so our team had like let's say like 10 or 12 total check bags and so usually one would be full of tools and one would be full well everybody on a personal one i guess but then you would have your your bridge box and so they would kind of look like really ghetto like pelican cases almost like we would call them uh uh, we had some funny name for them, but they're basically plywood boxes with a hinge full of foam, and we would place each piece in there and make sure it's secure. And it was always a moment of truth when we got to the competition and unpacked everything. I think two out of the four years I did it, we had something broken when we got to the regional competition, and it was a mad rush to try and find a welder to fix it. Like, it was, it was really tough to fix part of your bridge that's broke during uh, travel to the competition, before the competition. So um, yeah, being in Ohio, I we drove every year. Um, my first year um, on the team, we ended up loading the bridge up on my Pontiac Vibe, and I drove it um, a few hours to the competition, which was kind of fun. Um, my little car is way down as close to the ground as it could go. Um, but yeah, it was it was a lot simpler than uh, what Aaron just stated, and we you know just we had like three cars and loaded what we could into whoever's cars was available. Um, so we made that work. I know the my junior year, last year I competed, we actually got a university sponsored van, it was like college or engineering van. And that was kind of nice. It was like a 10 person van. We could put everything in that van. So we didn't have to load up my car again or anyone else's car. So that was nice. So if you can find an option with your university, take advantage of it. But yeah, we use university vehicles too. Um, to drive and one year bird flew into my windshield and cracked it, but it was the university vehicle and we were insured and it was fine. So that was uh, great from that aspect too, but it does make it easier to cram everything into a huge van instead of just driving a little car. Great, well, um, kind of shifting gears here, uh, you know, talking about getting support for your team. So in addition to your faculty advisor, usually, you know, play, plays a, a role in, in advising your team. Did you have any other advisors or mentors throughout the process? And how did you develop that relationship? I'll start with Kate. Um, yeah, so we, um, well, we have a great faculty advisor, so that always helps. But um, beyond that, usually the main times that we would um, get in touch with our alumni would be at the design review every year. So that would usually happen in the fall. And we would have gone through a couple design iterations for the bridge and, and have, you know, two or three top ideas um, that we wanted to get some feedback on. And so 
our team usually invite any alumni and if they were local, they could come in um, to a conference room and if not, we'd Skype people in and just hear what they had to say, or if they had any concerns. And sometimes people who aren't involved in the competition, uh, even if they haven't read the rules, they bring up good concerns that you might not have thought about. Um, so we had people who were recent alumni and then also we had a few local alumni who had graduated, you know, 10 or 20 years prior come. Um, so that was always a good way to keep up that network um, and get some support. Aside from that, if we had specific questions, um, it's always nice to ask your professors so that you, you know, understand the theory behind what you're doing um, or check in with other people in the machine shop. We would talk to the Baja racing team all the time to get tips about welding. So really use anybody that you can. Yeah, we did something similar to Kate where we used everyone we can, we could. Again, we had a pretty good faculty advisor um, at Ohio State who helped us out a lot. And then there's another structural engineering professor of whom when he was in undergrad and grad, he was helped out with Steel Bridge a lot. So he was also a major resource for us. I would often go to both of them. Um, the steel fabricator that we were partnered with, um, they would often give us a lot of uh, tips on how they wanted drawings done, how um, assembly um, production issues. And then we also partnered with some people in the mechanical engineering department, kind of similar to what Kate just said with the Baja team. And they actually taught us how to weld the one year. So that was kind of nice to be able to work with another group and uh, get some insight from them. And how about you, Aaron? You, you had some connections to some fabricators who helped you order materials, if, if I remember correctly? Yeah, so we um we had one donor in town that they were a local fabricator and they would actually handle all the ordering of materials, which was really nice. We'd give them a list um, and they would it'd take a couple weeks to find it. And sometimes we'd have to kind of swap members uh, just because of availability. A lot of the members that we're looking at, and I think you guys will probably end up looking at in the future, are, are very small and they're not really industry standards. Like it's a lot easier to find a W section that's like a hundred pound W section or something compared to this little uh, 30 second wall pipe. Like it's it's tiny stuff that I don't really know what the application would be in like not um, student bridge competition, I guess. Uh, but yeah, they would donate most material, uh, which was really great. And they would allow us to kind of go to their shop in the evenings mm -hmm. and set things up and usually cut pieces, which was nice. So they were a huge uh, support. And then towards the end of like uh, the practicing, usually like a week before the competition, we'd have a send off party. And that's where we'd invite all of our sponsors and everyone that was kind of associated with the bridge, um, like alumni, professors that helped, really just anybody that wanted to help at all. Um, and we, invite them all in for like a little some food, um, a little like, you know, talk and party sort of thing. And then we also do a test competition or a trial competition. And that's where we actually go through building the bridge and time ourselves. And we'd have like some judges there that would uh, count the drops and things like that. And we do load tests. And it was a really great way to kind of like work the bugs out of doing the build kind of under pressure. And that was really cool. And also our sponsors really liked seeing what we were doing. And it was a chance for them to actually be like, oh, this is what's going on. And we tried to do it after the competition a couple of years, but usually after competition, everyone was so burnt out and so behind and like classwork and stuff that it, it just made more sense to do it before. Um, so that's something that was really helpful. And it, it actually, I think, helped us gain a few more sponsors because they were they would invite other companies to come by and, and see what we were doing. They could see a lot of value in, in the uh, competition and, where their money was going. That's great. It's great to hear that, you know, all three of you had some connections to either alumni or local fabricators, maybe both. Um, and actually, you know, Kate, you know, you're talking about your design review and pulling an alumni there. And I realized I want to actually circle back then. Um, we didn't talk about designing your bridge. You know, we jumped right into fabrication, but you know, designing is also a, a pretty big component, analyzing it. Um, so I'm curious, you know, to hear all three of you you know, how do you how do you approach that design from your from your team standpoint? Do you have a design team? Um, you know, how do you how do you go about that process? And, um, we'll start with Kate. Yeah. Um, so usually, what we would do for the design process is um, we have one or two design leads that would coordinate how you know we should use the people available that felt comfortable designing and using analysis software. So that's always a little bit um, tricky because a lot of people on the team might not have taken structural engineering classes yet, um, especially if you're younger. So usually we have two kind of 
design leads and they would each take a different um, you know, path. And then they would have people helping them on each bridge. So like one year we would, you know, check to see if an overtrust was more efficient or just like a standard beam. Um, and then usually I was the person who was teaching newer team members how to use the software um, and going through that. But we would work on a couple bridge designs and try and get those optimized. And every once in a while you check in and, you, you know, do some cross team collaboration and see if you had any ideas you could steal from the other group. Um, and during this, you have to think about fabrication and construction as well. So we usually we'd task somebody with doing like a constructability review of the bridges and seeing, you know, how a rough estimate of how our pieces would be split up and how a build order might look, just to make sure that you don't get into a situation where it becomes nearly impossible to build the thing that you design. Um, so you want to avoid that, but um, usually it'd be a couple months of fine tuning things. And then towards the end, you end up with one or two bridges that really stand out. Um, and then we just have the big review with alumni to pick which one made the most sense. I think we did something similar that Kate was kind of saying. We usually have a couple of groups of like two people and it just depended on how many people were interested in that year and how many people kind of wanted to spearhead a design. Um, and so there'd be groups of two people and they would go through like a bridge design. And uh, right around Thanksgiving is kind of when we try to meet up and go through each of the designs and pick the best one. And it wasn't just like the design, it was usually we try to run like a cost analysis on it, be like, okay, this bridge can be, you know, 52 members, there's going to be 107 bolts. And we try to assign like a dollar amount based on like previous years um, to each of those two number members and the number of bolts and be like, all right, this is how much this bridge could uh, approximately cost. And um, that would usually come into play as well. And what also really helped is when the people that were designing put a lot of thought, in any case of this, into how you're going to actually fabricate it and what the pieces are going to look like because it's really easy to like draw a bridge in Risa and be like oh it looks great like that performs awesome and it's really hard to take that bridge and break it into into um into pieces that fit the rules like fit the the dimension requirements that's really hard and determining what kind of connections you want to use and what kind of connections are like easy to make or that you can make or just being realistic about the whole thing um it's hard to take a really good looking bridge and a bridge that performs well and turn it into something you can actually compete with. Yeah, so we, again, we did something similar to what Kate and Aaron did. Um, I think our time frame is a little bit further up. I would usually, or we usually split the team kind of into a connection side and more of a general structural side. And for the general structural side, um, we would usually, I know when I was captain, I had like four different semi teams of people of whom I gave them like kind of like a prototype of a bridge. And they're like, okay, I want you to go over, do something like this, have fun with it, or go under, et cetera. Um, another thing I want to touch on real quick is look at past designs other people have done. Um, I know our first year is that we just poured over images of like who won nationals, what their bridge looked like. Um, again, we weren't trying to steal the design, but we were trying to. Uh, just get some inspiration like what's a good idea what works what doesn't and and, uh, and the regional competitions you could easily tell which bridges worked and which ones didn't and that always shaped the next year's design um but anyway so i think i could be around october when i wanted us to select one bridge um that we would kind of focus on and then we kind of spent the next few months just optimizing that bridge as much as we could changing geometry heights section sizes and trying to Make that as light and as stiff as possible. And you all, you all kind of talked about dividing, dividing up the task, and dividing the different design teams. Um, how big were your teams? Um, you know, how many people did you have actively involved from start to finish? Uh, we'll kind of go backwards order. Let's start with Michael. Um, I think when I was captain, we had about ten people, about ten good members that were pretty regular. Uh, I know the year before we had a lot more. Um, there's a lot of younger people who were excited to start out the year. Um, for us, we've noticed that people drop off. Um, they start for the first few weeks and then they decide it's too much work. They want to focus on other things or they just don't feel like they're valued enough, um, unfortunately. Um, so usually we always start big. I think we started with 25 my senior year and ended up with 10 solid members towards the end. 
How about you, Aaron? Yeah, I'd say something similar. There's usually about 10 people every year that were kind of uh, poor people. And part of that too, and usually we'd have um, probably five to, well, maybe like seven to nine pretty dedicated people. Because um, at the beginning we of the bridge meeting in like September, we'd be really upfront with, with everybody and basically say like, you know, whoever gets to go to this competition is going to be based on how much effort and time you put in. And that's really true for us because we had to fly down. So we had to fundraise the money for people to fly. And it was really expensive. Um, we can only send a certain number of people. And so that actually provided a pretty good incentive for people to commit and show up and um, work on everything. But kind of um, reiterating what was previously said, people would lose interest after like a month or so, especially during the design phase, um, just because a lot of the younger students, you know, I say juniors maybe like the cutoff, but really the seniors plus the design, um, they would lose interest. And that was kind of okay, because uh, we could kick it back up when it came to like fabrication time. And we'd usually rely heavier on underclassmen to come and come do the grunt work, like grinding, prepping, um, cleaning the metal, things like that. And so we could, uh, uh, kind of stoke the fires of involvement towards the end of the end of the uh, first semester and into the second around Christmas time. Yeah, um, on our team we had probably around fifteen people that uh, you would consider like dedicated members, but within that there's a whole range of time commitment and what your role is on the team. And for us, I know that we tried to recruit. Um, Kind of basically anybody could join the team. We really tried to make people feel welcome and, you know, not be afraid to get into the machine shop or trying to remove some of those barriers to becoming involved in the team. And, you know, one year, like our captain had switched her major and she was a plant bio major by the end of it, but she had started off in engineering and still, you know, wanted to compete with the bridge team. So that was pretty cool. But I think that it's just, trying to get people involved in whatever interests them the most um, and getting people a feel for what the competition is like early on, I think really helps because if you're coming in and don't really know what to expect by the time you get to April, you're not going to care what we're doing in September, you know? Yeah, I think, that, I think that's a challenge that a lot of teams face is recruiting and retaining, you know, team members, especially the, the people who are maybe not quite as far along in their curriculum. Um, so it's, it's good to hear that, that you all had different approaches to, to incorporating those, those people along the way. Um, you know, do you, do you ever try to document things to pass it along to the next team? You know, how do you, as a you know, seasoned team captain moving on, you know, into your professional life, um, you know, how do you, how do you keep that continuity uh, for, the, for the, next, the next generation? Um, Michael, did you have any strategies for that? Uh, yeah, as I said, uh, my first year was kind of like a whole reboot year. We had no experienced people on the team. And so we kind of had this goal in mind from that point that we wanted to create like a kind of a legacy of, you know, teaching people and getting knowledge spread out. Um, so again, one of, the, one of the best ways to do that is to have people of all ages. You know, we have our seniors who do a lot of, a lot of the most work, but then we also have juniors and sophomores and even some freshmen and trying to make sure they all get involved so that way we can take that knowledge on the next year. Um, we had plans to like, create some kind of like a packet of like how to get started for Seal Bridge. Um, that we never ended up making that unfortunately. Um, that kind of got lost somewhere along the lines. But uh, again we, we focused on passing that knowledge on um, just verbally and through experience of older members. Um, unfortunately, COVID kind of really screwed with that um, because, you know, there's this big gap and now I have to have this webinar. Um, but um, one of the big things that we did is that we always tried to, quote unquote, groom the cap the next to his captain. Um, we would, at the end of the year, we would decide who the next captain was going to be if someone wanted to be the captain for the next year. Um, there was a few people with whom I had discussions with, and I was like, Captain, hey, you're really good at Steel Bridge. Thanks for doing this. How do you feel about leading next year? Um, consider it. And one of those people decided that they wanted to be the captain for the 2021 school year, and they were. So. Yeah, I think that uh, mentorship is the 
easiest way to pass on information. Um, so regardless of what your role is, uh, I think like, you know, people in design finding, you know, a younger buddy to work with. Um, I know like my senior year and towards when I was in grad school, um, I would still help out with fabrication and construction to, you know, pass on the information that I had learned. Um, we also had a Google Drive with just old budgets um, and some of the more administrative stuff that, you know, only one or two people are working on um, that aren't as related to the actual bridge, but more to the function of the team. So we pass that on to captains. Um, but I do think that showing people or thinking about how the team is going to develop once you're gone is really important and making sure there's not a huge gap where, you know, you don't have any sophomores so that by the time they're seniors, there's no seniors in the team. So you have to kind of plan ahead a little bit um, and not, you know, put all your eggs in one basket, I think. I agree with all those things. Um, kind of add to that too, is I think you can really rely on your alumni a lot. I think more often than not, they're happy to come in and help out. And one year we actually just built one of the old bridges as a practice run so all the new people could just see what's going on and they could ask questions about each piece and how you got to this design so on and so forth um, and that would really kind of help bridge the gap of knowledge between people that didn't really know what was going on or new people that just weren't experienced. Um, another thing we do or, or some people would try and do is you have a a folder um, that would have information on your bridge. So like for the last year, um, that bridge was sort of my design, I guess, or my main idea. I mean, it was our teams, but what I did is I just took a folder and I put in all of the important information, information I thought was important, like design of connections, design of the bridge. And then I actually had like a couple pages on the thought process on like why we went with that design and, you know, whether at the end of the paper is more like whether or not that was the way I thought it should have gone in hindsight and what we would have changed and done differently the next year. And I think even just reading that or going through some of that information, a new team from you know the next year, um, I think that helps out. It kind of just puts them in your shoes a little bit and s helps show why you made some of those decisions. Yeah, those are all great strategies. Um, and as we kind of start to approach the end of the webinar, I just just want to remind um, our audience that if you have some additional questions, feel free to drop those in the chat um, and we'll, we'll definitely share those with our panelists. Um, so I think a couple of you maybe mentioned a little bit with fundraising and financial support and again, depending on your travel or depending on how you're getting materials, you know, the amount of money that you need in order to do this competition may vary, um, but you know, kind of talk to me about what, how do you how do you approach fundraising? Do you have any unique strategies? Fundraising was really important for us just because um, even just to go to the competition, it would be about 10 grand a year, maybe 15, depending on where the competition was at. Um, and we'd usually try to solicit that from companies around town. That was really the, the main source of our fundraising. Uh, we'd have like a presentation generally based on the previous year's bridge and hopefully a video that went along with it of us like building it. And we would go to like a company uh, at like lunchtime, usually be like, hey, um, you know, can you donate 500 bucks or a thousand bucks? And we'll come in at lunch and do like a presentation for you. And, you know, obviously and after your workers can ask all the questions they want. Maybe we're not gonna have great answers, maybe we will. But I think we got some good um, reception from that. A lot of companies were kind of interested in that and they'd have us come on by and kind of tell about our, our, uh, our bridge and what we're doing. And we'd usually try to relate the competition as a whole to like an actual design project in real life where, you know, a customer comes to you with this problem and they've got a budget and a certain time frame, and you have to provide them with a, uh, provide them with a solution. And I think that's kind of where the fundraising, or not the fundraising, the sponsors really appreciated is that this was really like a real life situation. Um, it is a competition, which is a lot of fun, but I think it translates to, well to real world problems. Yeah, we also had a lot of industry sponsorships. Um, you know, there's several companies of which would donate to, I think like the ASCE um, pool, and then that money would also get spread to AISE even after the temporary split. And, um, you know, we were, we were able to get a lot of financial support from our, from our um, 
partners as well, like the fabricators usually would donate materials or funds and various other sponsors that we can get involved. Um, you know, the, um, like the welding gas supplier, I think they donate itself. And um, also the, uh, the Civil Engineering Alumni Association also every year makes all the student groups present at least at Ohio State and they were always giving us money. So that was great. Great. Um, okay, a couple, a couple of audience questions here. So um, a question about, you know, software in doing your analysis, you know, maybe unless you do everything by hand, um, you know, what's, what kind of software did you try to use? How did you kind of approach that? Um, um, I'll go first. Um, we use this at Ohio State, but also being a Berkeley grad, I'm a big CSI fan. Um, so I would say um, we use like SAP 2000 almost all the all the time. That was a big thing that we use. Um, I don't think we use any other major software. Um, a lot of our professors were capable of using it. Um, I think it was fairly easy to use, has a lot of capabilities. Um, so we were able to very easily, I think, teach people how to use SAP. There's a learning curve, but once you understand it, um, I think it helped out a lot. So we're able to easily teach it and then also gain data from those SAP models. And one, really, sorry. Oh, sorry, not to cut you off. One nice thing that we were able to do is we set up a template of just a SAP model, which just had like the, the loads and like the basic cores. So it allowed anyone to kind of go in and create their own design just based off this very basic template that we set up and just do a quick save as, and they can do whatever their hearts desire, which is kind of fun. We primarily use Risa for all our design, um, but part of that question looks like it's it says, uh, when do you need to order material? We would usually set a hard deadline of before we left for Christmas break. So like December 15th or something. And that's when we would have to, we would really prioritize to get that material list sent to our fabricator to order. Um, just because it would take weeks. It'd be like four or five, six weeks before the material got there and any hiccups or anything. And it was also nice because then it gave people a chance to kind of take a break over Christmas break and uh, come back fresh and then crush the bridge from there. Uh, yeah, we used Riza and SAP one year just to see what the differences were. We used Riza in school, um, but then we had heard that other teams used SAP. So one year, uh, we had our two teams modeled at different ways to see if there were any differences between the results. So that was a pretty fun experiment. Um, I honestly don't know what they use now, but one of those two programs. Um, and I would say just jumping on the, you know, kind of schedule aspect of that question, usually our general plan was to order steel by Thanksgiving. And then we kind of try and finish our CAD model um, and our final, you know, final analysis, any tweaking by the end of the semester. And then after winter break, we come back and start in on fabrication. Um, and we try and finish fabrication by like spring break, ideally. And then we'd have time for construction and load testing um, between that and our competition, which was in April. Yeah, just to address the timeline uh, again, I think our, we decided a, con a general conceptual design by probably early October. We had shop drawings done and ordered our steel right before spring, uh, Christmas break. And then right when we got the steel, we'd start fabricating, uh, you know, teaching people how to do stuff and then get done as far out as we can from our original competition, which as I said earlier, wasn't that far out. But. And I'll just uh, throw in kind of back to the software question. Uh, we have a couple of software sponsors who are sponsors of the program. Um, so DS SolidWorks and Bentley, um, and Bentley in particular does provide a, a student version um, of their software and make that free available for students. So if you don't have um, access to some of these other programs or you want to give that a try, that's that's definitely a resource that's that's available. I'll also add real quick, uh, since you mentioned SolidWorks, we did use SolidWorks to design our connections. And then we made drawings from that to submit for the fabricator. Um, another question, what are some ideas to sustain member involvement? A couple of you sort of alluded to that and see kind of those dips in participation. Um, are there any other 
ways or strategies that you've, you've found have been successful in keeping people actively involved? I think Kate kind of touched on this earlier, but we would build the old bridges. And I think that actually got the most hype, like with new members or people that were kind of interested or just wanted to see what it's about. We'd usually show them a video of how the bridge was built previous year and be like, all right, guys, have at it. Like, try to figure out how it all goes together. And uh, I think they enjoyed that a lot. And I think that got people kind of excited about being in Steel Bridge. Yeah, I would really agree with that. Um, that was one of the ways that we got people excited too. Um, also, not being afraid to give newer and younger members responsibilities, um, even if they're pretty small. Like sometimes we'd have somebody who was in charge of checking the rules throughout the year and they were like a rules expert. Um, so even if you don't have experience doing analysis, there are plenty of roles to fill on the team. Um, and then it makes it easier for the captains. I think sometimes when you're a captain, you think that you have to do everything yourself and that's just not how it works. There's a whole team for a reason. Um, the other thing that we usually do uh, is try and do an IM sports league in the fall um, before things get too crazy. So that's a good way to just you know have fun. Um, so that was the thing that I really looked forward to. And honestly, the reason I joined the team was to play flag football as a freshman. Um, I, I wish we did an inter intermittent team. That'd be a lot of fun. Um, one of the big ways that we got under involvement was having pizza at all the meetings. Um, that was a big draw. Um, but I guess to touch back on what I think Kate was saying was get the younger members involved make them feel worthwhile, um, make them feel like they're making a contribution. Um, and I would spend a lot of meetings helping out younger members or younger team members, like learning how to do stuff. Like I taught a freshman, uh, my senior year, how to use a steel manual for certain things and how to design certain connections. And, you know, it was cool because I was, this freshman was able to, you know, design one of our connections for the bridge. Um, some of the other new members, they also designed some connections and we got those load tested. And it was really cool to be able to say, hey, see this connection these guys made? They're brand new to the team, but yet we load tested it. It held, you know, three times as much load as we needed them as we needed it to. It to. So just trying to get everyone involved and make them feel valued. We are unfortunately quickly running out of time. So my very last question for all of you is, what is your one piece of parting advice uh, that you would give a team that's just starting out or maybe rebooting their team after a couple of years? You know, if you could give them a, a word of wisdom, what would it be? Uh, uh, start, start with Aaron. Yeah, for like a new team or a team that just hasn't been super active and doesn't have a lot of like uh, uh, knowledge or previous year's knowledge within that team, I'd say just keep it as simple as you can because it's going to take way longer than you think and it's going to be way harder than you think to design and fabricate and construct this. And there's, I don't think there's any sense in trying to make the most elaborate bridge. I think the goal really is to get to the competition. And after that, you can, you know, the sky's the limit. But just understanding how the competition works and getting there. And this kind of, you know, we would have this, this we, we say, you know, keep it simple, stupid. That was kind of our, our motto um, the first year. Keep it as simple as we can, and we'll go from there. And it still ended up being really complicated. How about you, Kate? Um, or Michael? Go ahead, Michael. <laughs> sorry, Kate. Um, again, this is like very generic advice, but ask questions. Um, and ask as many questions as you possibly can. Um, you know, I was when I was a captain, I was, my, I was the most experienced person on the team. I'd probably go and bug my professor about Steven Bridge like every other day, if not more. Um, and I would just constantly, you know, ask them about different ideas, things that they've done, and how to make the competition work. So ask questions, get advice from people who know what they're doing. Um, and again, reach out to a former alumni, uh, which other people have said, kind of get their input, get what they've done, what didn't work, and you know, just try to learn as much as you can. And I also agree, you know, keep it simple with the bridge. Don't try to do anything crazy your first year, but try to learn as much as you can. Yeah, I would echo all of that advice. And I would also just say that this is a great time to learn and be creative and try new things. And although it, you know, it stinks if a bridge fails, it also doesn't matter. Because like once you get out into the real world, it matters a little bit more. 
Um, so it's a great time to you know try different things, like get advice from your alumni if you have them, but also just go for it because it is it's a competition. It's supposed to be fun. It's kind of ridiculous. We used to always say we were building a toy bridge, and it's true, and it will prepare you for real life, but also it doesn't matter at the end of the day. So I would say try your best and get to competition and go for it, but it's just more about the process behind it and the effort and knowledge that comes from that that I think is the most important part. Well, thank you to all three of you. Um, really appreciate you sharing your experiences and your advice um, and just taking the time today to, to talk with me and, and pass it along to the next generation of, of SSPC students. Um, so before we go, I just have a couple of things for our audience. Um, there is a post event survey that will be linked in the chat. Um, so grab that link before you log off and let us know what you thought of the webinar. Um, and if you have any, um, any topics or things that you want to see as we do these throughout the year, uh, we would love to hear from you. And then I encourage you to download and review the official rules. As you know, all three of our panelists said, read the rules, get familiar with those and also check out the competitor's guide on the team resources page of our website. And then if you haven't already, sign up for SSBC email updates so you can get the latest and greatest news about what's happening. And then uh, last but not least, be sure to complete ASCE's uh, student chapter SSBC participation form by October 30th so that we know that you plan to participate and then we can, uh, you can make sure you get that $500 stipend for participating in the regional competition. Um, so one more time, a big thank you to Kate, Aaron, and Michael for joining me today um, and for the great conversation. And uh, thank you to our audience. Um, hopefully this was informative and you were able to take away some, some nuggets of information and take that back to your team. And best of luck to you for the 2022 SSBC. Look forward to seeing you in the spring. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>